Um, as you can see, it's on the preoperative assessment and electrolyte management. Now, two kind of loosely connected topics and the fact that they deal with surgical patients. Um, I chose this topic because I, I feel like I have kind of an experience deficit and a knowledge deficit as well in some parts of it for each of these things. Um, and so while I did a lot of reading, putting this together, tried to learn a lot, obviously not a master at it because I have a deficit. So if any of y'all want to chime in at any time, ask any questions, y'all please do and help me out. So we'll start off <coughs> um, with a little bit of a history lesson. This is the same guy, uh, just two different pictures of him. Um, does anybody know who he is? I have no idea who he is. Yeah, very good. Well, kind of. Um, all right, so that is Ambrose Perre. He's a French surgeon. Um, he was quoted as saying, to perform surgery is to eliminate that which is superfluous, restore that which has been dislocated, separate that which has been united, and join that which has been divided, and repair the defects of nature. Um, he was considered one of the uh, fathers of modern surgery um, because he kind of caused a paradigm shift um, in the fact that he actually cared for his patients. He showed compassion. He showed care for them. Um, that's another picture of him. It's a painting of him. Um, okay. Um, so you don't have to know the painting or anything. Do y'all know what is going on in this painting? What What are they doing right there? Do y'all know? Definition, yeah. releasing evil humors. Okay. You're, you can't answer any. <laughs> That's good, yeah. So, trepanation. So, burn holes in skulls. Um, so, this is kind of the oldest form of surgery uh, that we can find recorded evidence of. Um, you can see in the picture here, there's different ways to do it, just like there's different ways to do surgeries that we do. Um, you could scrape the skull until you get a hole in it. You could, um, and these other ones, you kind of drill or burn into the skull until you cut it. They use kind of some knives and drills and things like that. This was thought to have been done as early as the Stone Age, okay, or the Neolithic era. Um, it continued on um, through kind of the Roman era, things like that. Um, so they kind of used this for investigating and cleaning head wounds. Uh, they also used it to treat disorders of mood, depression, uh, probably schizophrenia, things like that. Um, they also thought that, well, the evidence points that they thought that this may be remedied seizures and migraines and such maladies. And this is an actual skull with the, he had it done, or she had it done four times um, and evidently lived through a couple of them, so. Um, <clears throat> and these are some tools just from the medieval era just to kind of show you where we've come from. Um, so we went from scraping holes in the side of someone's skull to having saws and clamps and such. These are similar instruments, but just uh, around the Renaissance time. So a little bit different looking. Um, I mean, you, know, you have your knives here. They have a mallet um, and clamps. You might know this, Dr. Roy. I don't know if that's suction. I thought that maybe was suction. I'm not sure. Um, all right, and these are modern tools, OK? Just different pictures of all these modern tools. Just to show the kind of progression of where we've been and where we're at now. Um, you know, now we have Bovi electricity and ultimately the Da Vinci, which is kind of right now pinnacle of technology mixing with medicine. So, um, even though the technology has become <clears throat> more complicated, um, uh, the care of our patients really should remain simple. Um, they come in with a problem, we listen to them, we do an exam, we do some tests, we figure out what's wrong, and we try and help them. Um, <clears throat> and it's a it's a privilege to do that. So <clears throat> this is kind of a quote out of out of Talens. <clears throat> um, Successful surgical outcomes of operative gyneolo gynecologic procedures occur as the result of several factors in addition to good surgical skills and techniques. So <clears throat> right there, they're telling you that you could be the best surgeon you could know the most, and things can still go wrong. Um, and in order to prevent that from happening, um, some things you can do are appropriate, appropriate preoperative evaluation of your patients. Um, 
appropriate patient selection. Uh, does your patient need surgery? Can they be treated medically? Um, are they a candidate for surgery? Will, they, will, will surgery um, be detrimental to them? Um, and then also an appropriate discussion with the patient regarding the benefits and risk of their surgery. You know, <clears throat> some people, we deal with it not all that often, but some people just flat out refuse surgery even though they have endometrial cancer and um, hysterectomy is relatively curative. They don't want it. Um, they may have good reasons, they may not. Um, but it's, it's our job um, as their physicians, as their potential surgeons, to be thorough and almost compulsive, which some people have to learn, like myself, um, in regards to screening and workup prior to surgery. Um, especially our, our cases in OBGYN, you know, gonoc aside, are elective and our patients are relatively healthy. Um, so in order to accurately assess our patients, so do our, an appropriate preoperative evaluation, um, we need a few things. Um, and these things are fairly simple at first. You need a history, you need a physical exam, um, you may or may not need labs or imaging. You may or may not need procedures beforehand, biopsies, uh, endometrial biopsy, things like that um, in order to make diagnosis, um, make the right decision for your patient. Also consultation. Um, do you need other services or other doctors even in your same field or a different field to help you out? Um, and it's okay if you do. So. <clears throat> um, some things you have to kind of ask yourself when you're seeing your patient for the first time, you're thinking maybe surgery will help her, or in our case her, um, you know, you want to know is this patient in optimal health? We never talked about that. Can she survive surgery? Will surgery be detrimental to her? Um, does she have comorbidities? Does she have high blood pressure? Does she have diabetes? Do these things affect her kidneys, her legs, her eyes, things like that? because uh, all that can potentially affect the outcome of your surgery um, or the patient's outcome. Um, and then can or should the patient's physical or mental condition be improved prior to surgery? Um, is, there, is there a need for some other workup, some other procedure before you do your elective surgery on it? Um, and then does she use any medications that may unexpectedly influence um, the perioperative outcomes? So <clears throat> you have to be able to communicate all that to and with your patient to kind of glean that information from her. So <clears throat> this is just kind of my outline for I use for my history. Okay, we have past medical, past surgical meds, allergies, past OB history, past gyne, social, family, and menstrual history. Um, and so whenever I talk to the patient, this is generally the things that I ask about. High blood pressure, diabetes, and you can see them there. Well, through reading um, on our new OB patients and, you know, in our, because they could potentially be surgical patients, um, and our GYN patients, you're seeing for the first time, this needs to be a little more extensive, okay, and needs to kind of look like this. Um, you need to make sure you're asking your patient directly about these things and not just because just they don't have high blood pressure. They say they don't have high blood pressure. They don't have some of these other things like AFib. They could have AFib without hypertension. Um, you know, history of some other kind of stroke, embolic stroke without hypertension. Okay, so we just have to be thorough. Um, and past surgical history is no other real special um, questions or qualifications. Just make sure you're thorough and seeing what surgeries they had before that can affect <clears throat> your outcome, um, the time of surgery, things like that. She's had abdominal surgeries before. Um, and then, so meds here, I, I don't, I rarely ask about herbal medicines, and I guess I should start, because um, there are quite a few that can make a difference on certain parts of the surgery. Um, so if your patient is on or needs anticoagulants. If they take garlic, ginger, ginkgo, or ginseng, okay, they can potentiate the effects of those. Um, if your um, patient is diabetic and you are starting some medicine on her or put her on some 
um, insulin post-op. And she's on, she takes garlic, uh, some dandelion. Those can potentiate hypoglycemia. Um, some other things, especially with the surgery. So uh, valerian root and St. John's wort can actually make sedation deeper. It can potentiate the effects of sedation. Um, so you just got to be careful. I, I never really think to ask that. So we'll start. Um, and then you got to know. There are certain, you know, they may not know why they're taking a certain medication or a certain herbal supplement. And so if they have certain things in their past medical history, like high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, um, elevated lipids, um, you got to think about some of these things. Like, you know, garlic's on there a couple of times. And garlic is marketed as being an effective aid to treatment for high blood pressure, coronary artery disease, hyperlipidemia. Say it can help with GI ulcers, um, preventing tick bites, which I didn't really understand. Some people use it topically to fight fungal infections, um, and it's marketed as being able to combat the common cold. So there's a lot of, a lot of reasons patients may or may not be on these medicines. You've got to ask. Um, allergies, that's kind of straightforward. Just make sure when you are getting their allergies from you, don't just ask what they're allergic to. Try and get a timeline when it happened, what happens whenever they take that medicine, and things like that. Um, for the OB history, um, you know, obviously you want to know how many times she's been pregnant, how many babies she's had, um, things like that. We ask them, we ask all these things pretty routinely. And for the GYN history, it's just routinely what I get. Um, uh, in Talens, they talk about just making sure you get a good STD history um, and sexual history, especially if they have pelvic pain. Um, you know, you don't know if their pelvic pain is from dyspareunia or assault or anything like that. So you just got to think about all those things. And again, social, family, menstrual, <clears throat> we kind of all do this all routinely. Um, okay. And as an OBGYN, our patients, we may be the only doctor that, that they come and see. Um, they may not go to a G, uh, an internist or a family medicine doctor every year to have their annual. Um, or even when they have a cold, they might come to just us. So when you're seeing these patients for the first time um, and you're doing your pre-op exam, you, you owe it to them and <clears throat> to do a full exam. Um, you know, I know like some other surgical specialties, they can do a focus exam, but we should not. Okay, it's advised that we do full exam vitals, neuro assessment by checking their um, you know, their reflexes, checking their sensation in the lower upper extremities, um, their cranial nerves. You want to, you know, check for any kind of um, thyroid abnormalities. We, you know, routinely do heart and lung exam. Breast exam is pretty routine for us. Um, abdominal pelvic exam. But these, these other things, we need to really start looking at doing more routinely. Um, just because our patients may not get to the doctor as often as they should. <coughs> Okay, and so part of the interesting thing, or kind of my deficit, was that for our pre-op exams, our pre-op evaluation, we routinely get BMP, CBC, type and screen on everybody. Um, and in some cases, actually, it's not warranted to get all of them. Um, with, with every patient, you're going to get a type and screen. Um, I don't know if I would be comfortable not having a CBC, but some patients don't even need it. Um, for a platelet count stuff, you just need an H and H. Um, there's been so probably about 1960s or so. Um, whenever, um, sorry, whenever um, routine lab analyzers became available to doctors, we just started getting a battery of all these tests and didn't really. We kind of slacked on relying on history and physical, and just got these tests, and that kind of continued on until about 30 years ago. Um, and there's been a lot of information in the last 15 years. Um, and we're trying to go back to what test is right for your patient um, with their type of surgery they're having, their risk, um, and getting just those. Um, uh, right now, uh, in a lot of places, convention is, you know, get all your routine tests. Now, they've done a lot of cost, cost analysis on all this. Um, and we could, just ordering the right test, on the right patients preoperatively, they estimate that we could save about $20 million a year 
in healthcare, which is a pretty good amount. So, and this was a this was a paper um, I looked at. It's called the role of routine laboratory investigations in pre-op evaluation by a guy named Kumars of the Journal of Anesthesiology and Clinical Farm in 2011. It was just a literature review, um, and they kind of looked at perform a routine routine test and all surgical patients as a screening tool um, and they found that it was inefficient unnecessary and expensive and that the um, the value of pre-op screening um, lies in the clinician's assessment um, of the patient just like we talked about sorry so <clears throat> they concluded in the end the patient sh uh, the doctor should not be guided by tradition um, or cost alone, but should be guided by what's going on with the patient and their risk. Um, and then they also talked about uh, a lot of doctors kind of fall back on a large battery of tests and say, well, if I get these tests and they're normal, then I'm protected by the, you know, I'm protected legally uh, if something were to happen. But actually they find that some doctors get these tests, don't really check them, or they'll get abnormal results and don't do anything with them, and then something happens, and then they're opened up for legal action. So it's actually the opposite of what they intended. And in in their review, this is um, what Kumar um, kind of recommends uh, when you get to get certain labs for. So you can see not all patients need a complete bl blood count. Um, you can probably just get away with an H and H on a patient that's going for a tubal. Um, you don't really need platelets or anything. Um, we get a BMP routinely. We kind of don't need to unless they have high blood pressure, diabetes, any kind of overlying, uh, underlying renal disease. Now, but our patient population tends to have more of these these comorbidities, so we do get them more often than not, and that's okay. But when we get out in practice. We may not need to get these tests all the time and kind of get out of the habit of ordering all these tests all the time. Um, okay, <clears throat> and for um, surgical stratification, there's low risk surgery, intermediate risk surgery, and high risk surgery. Your low risk surgeries typically have a cardiac complication rate about less than 1%. You can see it deals with breast surgery, superficial surgery, ambulatory surgery, and endoscopy. So, a good bit of our types of surgeries deal with low risk surgery uh, and then the intermediate risk as well and that uh, cardiac complication risk for intermediate risk surgery is one to five percent um, and that's all of our majors so I would say our, our minors are here our majors are here and we don't typically have any high risk surgeries um, I don't know who gone out we you know we have some longer surgeries with some patients who typically are sicker um, I would say our high risk that we're going to see a lot is Probably ectopic patient, uh, unstable ectopic patients, so that'll be our high-risk surgeries. Um, not only do we stratify um, the, the type of surgery that the patients are going to undergo, but we, strat we try and stratify the patient themselves. And this is um, from the uh, Society of Anesthesiologists, um, just their ASA class. You'll hear them say, oh, they're ASA 1, ASA 2, ASA 3. Um, but this kind of means that, so ASA1, they're completely, completely healthy, no issues. This might be a postpartum tubal. She had no problems. She may be an ASA1. Um, an ASA2, I'd say, would be probably the bulk of our patients. Mild systemic disease um, may or may not be related to the surgery they're having. So they may have some high blood pressure or some diabetes, but it's well controlled. Um, they're having some menorrhagia, and they're getting a hysterectomy. Um, so she'd be intermediate risk surgery and she'd be an ASA too. Um, <clears throat> and as they go up um, through the levels, um, the risk for m mortality increases. Um, and another way, so we, all, you know, we usually send, whenever we have patients that have some other comorbidities and we want some preoperative clearance on the patients, we'll send them to medicine or family medicine and they'll do clearance for us and they'll tell us what cardiac risk they are for what surgery and how many METs they can perform and things like that. It's not something we routinely do. However, I think if 
we kind of take on the responsibility of assigning these to our patients or evaluating our patients uh, before we send them for clearance, we may get a better idea of how our patients are going to do and how they do. And over time, you'll learn to pick up on all that a little quicker with each patient. Um, so for the METs, they're metabolic equivalents of oxygen consumption. One MET is equal to um, uh, oxygen, oh, oxygen consumption of one resting adult. Okay, so when they say, oh, they're METs one to four, really they can't do activities of daily living. Um, they can't fix their own food, walk around the house, clean, clean up after themselves, dress themselves. Um, they may have some heavy breathing or issues walking, just a normal block. Um, and these patients, uh, when they have the, their uh, METs are less than four, they're at a much higher cardiac risk, okay? Um, five, five to nine and above 10 is most everybody in here. Um, I don't do any strenuous sports, so I'm not METs of 10. But um, five through nine, you can walk a block, walk up a hill, um, do sprints if you wanted to, and not have any chest pain, any issues. Oops, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so after going through and kind of understanding what risk surgery your patient is going to have and at what risk your patient is, looking at their ASA and their METs, um, you can then stratify the patient for yourself. Um, and kind of decide what workup they need. So an ASA 1 patient, she's got no other issues, she's going through low risk or even intermediate risk surgery, you can just follow these guidelines here. She, she needs a UPT, she needs an H&H &H if she's above six months, and I would say all of our patients are. If she's older than 40, then she gets an EKG as well, and if she's older than 65, you add on a BMP. And that's it. That's all our patients need if they're very low risk and don't have any issues. Okay. Um, the problem comes in is our patients start having <clears throat> all these issues. You know, they have high blood pressure, diabetes. You know, what, what do we do with them? What other kind of workup do we need? Um, so whenever you add on... Um, uh, Normal, pet, normal risk patient, ASA1, ASA2, um, but they have kind of a complicated medical uh, or GYN um, component. So they've had previous abdominal pelvic surgery. Um, you're anticipating adhesions. Um, they may have large ovarian cysts, they have tumors, they have an infection um, like PI, um, tubo ovarian abscess or something like that, or they have active or chronic bleeding, which I mean, some of our um, mineralogia patients do, then you need to do a little bit extra for them, okay? So you get all the same things we have up here, um, but then you'll, instead of getting just an H&H, &H, you'll get a CBC, because you want to, if they have TOAs or some kind of infection, you want to see where their white count is. If they're actively bleeding or have chronic bleed, you want to see what their, um, their platelets are like, <clears throat> and, and on top of their H&H, &H, which we do that pretty well. Um, you can get coags as well if they have chronic or active bleeding. Um, if they have any other kind of underlying liver or renal disease, then you want to get LFTs or a renal function panel, depending on what's going on with them. Um, STD screening is kind of up to you. Same thing with a drug screen. Um, it may or may not impact surgery. It depends on what's going on, but you can get it. Um, and if they have a little bit extra going on, then you can consult anesthesia. Luckily for us, anesthesia talks to all our patients, so we don't really ever have to truly consult them. Um, and when you throw <clears throat> a complicated GYN, GYN history, just, um, like the last scenario, and you throw complicated medical or surgical history, such as um, you know, cardiac or pulmonary disease, vascular disease, um, you got to go a little further. So you get all the same things, um, but if they have any kind of bleeding history that's not related to her reproductive tract, then you want to go ahead and get um, an INR as well uh, with a PTT and you want to work, you can work them up 
for um, thrombophilia if you need to before surgery, if you think that's what's going on with them. Um, but you just want to stratify your patients and order the right test at the right time instead of getting every, every test on everybody. Okay. So that's kind of the first part of the presentation, the preoperative assessment. Um, I think the kind of take-home message of that is as you go through your training and as you gain experience seeing patients, seeing sick patients, you'll learn what patients need to see, uh, you need to consult other physicians on, what patients um, are going to be at increased risk, um, and you need to keep in mind that it's not beneficial for yourself or the patient just to test them for every lab under the sun. They, they all don't need a chest x-ray. Uh, they all don't need EKG. Just kind of do what's right for the patient. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I bought you off. You got free left now. I want to make sure nobody else did that. Hey, uh, we can hear you. <laughs> quiet, real quiet. <laughs> All right. So the second part of the talk, <laughs> the second part of the talk is about fluid balance and um, electrolyte balance. Now, I until this year thought I was didn't have a deficit in this stuff, but I do. Um, we don't routinely deal with a lot of abnormal electrolytes. We don't routinely deal with sick patients who are um, hypovolemic when they come in uh, or we need to worry about hypervolemia um, because of what we're doing, what we're giving her. Um, while I was on tumor, I learned these patients can be really sick and they don't look too sick until their creatinine jumps to 1.7 and we haven't hydrated them. So, um, so fluid balance in surgical patients, especially those with pre-existing comorbidities, um, that can affect renal function. Um, it's imperative that um, you fix any deficit because you can cause acute kidney injury pretty readily, um, even in a healthy patient, but they tend to bounce back pretty easily. Um, a few risk factors for uh, our patients um, for perioperative acute kidney injury, um, they, they have chronic kidney disease. Obviously, you can, their kidneys aren't as elastic, any kind of insult. Um, will hurt them a lot quicker, a lot harder. Um, chronic hypertension, um, especially if they have underlying renal involvement, and other cardiac disease, diabetes, and any liver disease as well. Um, so when you're looking at acute kidney injury, um, these rifle criteria, they consist of these top three. They're kind of um, grades of kidney injury, and the last two are looking kind of at outcomes of kidney injury. So a patient at risk for acute kidney injury, um, a period over, if you're watching them over, they say seven days, typically we try and act a little quicker than that, but um, a rise in her creatinine about 1.5 times her baseline, or a drop in her GFR by about 25%, um, or a decrease in her urine output to about less than um, 0.5 mils per kg per hour over six hours. That puts that puts your patients at risk for acute kidney injury. Okay, they're not in injury yet. Um, when they get injury, um, the lab work will show a doubling of their creatinine, a, dr uh, a drop in the GFR by half, um, and you'll still have the same decrease in output, but it's over 12 hours. Um, and when they're in kidney failure, you'll see the creatinine usually triple. The GFR will drop by 75%. Um, and their urine output, or their urine output, can be less than 0.3 milliliters per kg per hour, and that's over a 24-hour period, uh, or they haven't peed at all in 12 hours. Um, and so, with the loss down here, um, these patients are usually on dialysis for uh, at least four weeks, and then to be considered end-stage renal disease, uh, they're on it for about three months. <clears throat> when you're talking about acute kidney injury and fluid balance and everything, you always want to know if the injury is pre-renal, which is usually from hypovolemia. Um, of course, you have these other things here that kind of result in hypovolemia or decreased blood pressure and perfusion. Um, and 
and even some meds can do it too, sorry. Um, some meds can do it as well. Um, you get your ACE inhibitors and NSAIDs. They can damage the kidney themselves and cause intrinsic or renal injury, which we'll talk about in a second too. Um, but they, like NSAIDs, they can cause dilation of the, um, or they can cause uh, issues with the vasculature of the kidney. Um, when you get intrinsic disease, that's disease of the kidney itself. Um, you know, you have ATN, acute interstitial um, nephritis, uh, glomerular nephritis, um, and renal tubular obstruction. So with ATN, usually it's due to ischemia, not just hypovolemia, but you get a true ischemia from shock or sepsis. Um, certain medicines can do it, radio contrast, uh, amino glycosides um, like gent, uh, uh, vancomycin can do it, and cisplatin. Um, so they can damage the kidney itself um, and cause um, tubular necrosis, which can lead to long-term disease of the kidney. Um, so post, um, so we talked about pre-renal, renal, and post-renal. Um, post-renal really is just any kind of obstruction or, like I said, the bladder doesn't work. Um, they have neurogenic bladder from diabetes or um, nerve injury or they have stones that get a ureteral obstruction, or they have a large mass and they get ureteral obstruction. Um, you can get kidney damage that way um, by urine not being able to drain out, backing up into the, the renal pelvis and um, damaging the kidney that way. So <clears throat> we uh, probably learned this sometime in med school. Um, it's not an equation that I use very often. I actually used it quite often when we were on tumor. Um, we had a patient who, um, I mean, her, her creatinine just jumped up sky high after surgery. Um, she was, she had a fluid deficit, and we kept hydrating her pretty aggressively, but it was slowly coming back up. It was coming, I mean, coming back down. But we wanted to do the FENA, or the fractional excretion of sodium, to make sure that it was just a pre-renal insult and not anything else going on with her. Um, she had really bad diabetes and she probably had underlying kidney disease that <clears throat> just never manifested itself. So to calculate the FENA, um, you get a BMP and you collect some urine roughly at the same time. Um, and you get the urinary sodium, urinary creatinine, plug it up uh, into the equation with your plasma sodium and plasma creatinine, and multiply by 100 and should spit out a number. Now this number should be less than 1% um, if, if your injury is pre-renal, okay? If it's just hypovolemia um, and you need a hydrator. If it's, and there's kind of a gray area, one to 2%, but if it's over 2%, um, then it's likely renal or post-renal. Uh, and you need to go figure out what's going on, stop any kind of nephrotoxic drugs, you know, um, work her up for any kind of renal disease, things like that. So <clears throat> with fluid imbalance, uh, especially in with surgery, uh, prevention is the treatment. Um, it's the best thing you can do for the patient. The patient. You want to optimize her volume status. Um, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing you can do for her. Um, now, I looked up <clears throat> Some articles on bowel prep. We don't routinely do bowel preps for our GYN patients unless we're expecting a lot of adhesive disease. Um, and we may get into the bowel, something like that. We do it routinely on gynoc. Um, but several of the newer papers, now I did, it wasn't talking about gynoc, it was just talking about benign GYN. Um, they recommend against bowel preps. Um, there were several studies that looked at bowel preps with laparoscopic hysterectomy, vaginal hysterectomy. Um, and open hysterectomies, and there was no difference in the ability to visualize any of your structures. There was no difference in the incident of bowel injury. Um, and so the, the risk of this um, dehydration because of the uh, diarrhea that we give them from the bowel prep um, kind of outweighs the benefit. Okay, so another thing that we should be doing routinely um, is calculating the ins and outs. Um, you know, after surgery, we get strict eyes and nose every two hours on our patients. Um, and we do really good about staying on um, our nursing staff and their aides to help us out with that. Um, but there are 
other parts of intake and output um, that we can't really measure, okay? So for us, in the intake, all we can really do is measure how much the patient's taken in orally, fluid-wise, and I don't even think that's that accurate, because I, I doubt that our nursing staff is measuring every milliliter a patient's taken in. Um, but when they have IV fluids, we can measure it pretty readily. Um, you know, in the, the water, um, Uh, water and solid foods, I mean, we don't take that into account. Um, that's probably about a uh, day's diet. There's about 800 cc's to a liter of water in there. So we kind of don't factor that into any of our fluid balance, and we should. Um, for output, uh, really the only clinically significant uh, fluid output that we can measure is urine. Um, we do that pretty readily as well. So you can't really measure the loss from sweat. Um, it depends on the patient's hydration status, where they are, the temperature in the room, or wherever they are, um, how much they lose. And it could be a, a couple liters a day. Um, when they pass a stool, you know, they just kind of mark it on the chart. Well, they pass the stool, they don't ever quantify it. And that's sometimes 80 to 100 cc's of fluid. Um, skin evaporation, you can lose 450 cc's in a day. Um, if our patients are febrile, they can lose a little bit more. Um, and then you get some evaporation from the surface of the lungs as well. So just with, if you have a bowel movement a day and your daily loss from your evaporation, that's an extra two liters there. And then, you know, from sweat, that's a liter or two. So you can see it's easy to kind of get behind if you're not calculating any of that. Um, so as a surgeon, we have to be aware of that. Um, look at her vitals, make sure she's doing okay. Our, our patients typically do well. Okay, so this paper I looked at, um, it's called the Perioperative Fluid Management to Enhance Recovery. It's by a guy named Gupta um, in the Anesthesia Journal in 2016. It was a, <coughs> so it was a kind of strange article. It, it was a review um, and he proposed that um, low-risk patients um, come in in a kind of euvolemic state. So they're not NPO after midnight. Um, they actually encourage them to drink clear liquids up to two hours before surgery. Um, and they could even drink like Gatorade and things like that. Um, and when they came in intraoperatively, um, they accounted for all the losses that we talked about and they replaced it as they needed. Um, and you know, they had, a ma they had maintenance fluid and if they needed a bolus to do 250 or 500, they would never give a liter. Um, and there wasn't, he, they said they started doing this in their um, institution. They're going to have follow-up um, studies to kind of look at it. I thought it was interesting because I think it's similar to how we, our, our anesthesiologists manage our patients here. They look at their vitals. Um, they have them kind of on maintenance fluid. They don't give them a whole lot beforehand. So I think that's the way kind of anesthesia care is going with fluid balance in the OR. Um, this paper... Um, Uh, this paper is by Silva et al. is in the Critical Care Journal. Um, they did a prospective, took a prospective cohort of 479 patients um, who underwent surgery. Uh, the mean time was about four hours, but these patients all went to the ICU after. Um, and they looked at their intraoperative fluid balance um, between patients who made it out the hospital and patients who didn't. Um, the patients who didn't make it, they had an excess, uh, intraop excess of about two liters. Um, and the survivors, the pa pa patients that made it out of the ICU and went home, only had, had an excess of 1,400. So it didn't seem like a whole lot. It's a 600 cc difference. Um, but they found it was statistically significant. The p-value was less than 0 0.001. Um, they also looked at the ICU stay length, um, infection rates, uh, Neurological, cardiovascular, and respiratory complications, everything was higher um, in the patients that had greater than 2,000 um, milliliters in the OR. Um, and then they used multivariate, multivariate analysis uh, to analyze all their data. Um, and they found that fluid balance in and of itself was an independent factor for mortality in these patients. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The odds ratio uh, was 1.024 for every 100 cc's. 
um, which is kind of interesting. So, so they showed that patients with excessive intra-op intra fluid balance, they have more complications and higher mortality. The issue with this is um, these are all very sick patients. They had to go to the ICU, so it's difficult to extrapolate to a lower risk population. Um, and it just kind of shows us, though, how important um, fluid balance is. That's really kind of the point of that paper. Um, and this paper by Alan et al. out of the Journal of Extracorporeal Technology in 2014. Um, it was also a review paper. Um, they wanted to look at kind of two different things, whether crystalloid or colloid were better for volume expansion, um, and then whether um, normal saline or things like plasmalite and lactate ringer were better um, compared to each other. So <clears throat> they looked at a bunch of studies um, looking at crystalloid versus colloid. Um, one of the ones they cited, the more important ones, was called the SAFE study is in 2004. It was a multi-center randomized control um, trial. They compared fluid administration over four days. Um, and you know, a good uh, portion of the patients got um, albumin and another portion got um, normal saline. And they found that the, um, the ratio of crystalloid to colloid um, was 1 to 1 1.4, so they were relatively even. Um, in the volume expansion, um, and the expected ratio would be one to five. You expect a volume expansion five times more with a colloid than you would with um, normal saline or lactate ring or things like that. Um, and so since the volume expansion um, in practical use was much smaller um, and there were no differences in morbidity and mortality, um, they kind of concluded that it was better to use crystalloid rather than trying to use colloid for um, fluid resuscitation on these patients. Um, and then when they looked at <clears throat> uh, the balanced electrolyte solutions like plasmalite and lactated ringers versus normal saline, um, they said there wasn't really a whole lot of good research. They um, recognized that there's some potential harms with large, large volumes of normal saline, but said they couldn't find anything statistically or clinically significant with it, and they'll be doing future studies. Um, okay, we'll move on to the last little part here, um, dealing with electrolyte imbalance, um, which if you're going to take care of um, surgical patients um, and they have abnormal fluids, they're likely going to have abnormal electrolytes. So you need to know how to recognize kind of signs and symptoms of <clears throat> these um, abnormalities and know how to treat them, replete them. Or, um, get their levels back down if you need to. Um, so with low sodium, um, these patients typically are asymptomatic until the, you know, the um, level of the sodium is about 125 milliequivalents. Um, and you'll, you can start seeing CNS symptoms, seizures. Um, they can go into a coma. So <clears throat> if you have a patient and you're taking care of them and this is going on, um, Obviously, the first thing you should do is call help. Call your staff. Call the MI. Um, we need help with this. We shouldn't do any of this alone. But I thought it would be beneficial to kind of show you how to calculate, <coughs> um, how to overcome the deficit if you needed to. That way you can get it started while you're waiting on someone to come help you out. Um, so there's a little formula here. Uh, you take the weight of, uh, in kilograms of the patient, multiply it by 0.6. Um, and you have what your sodium level is, or your desired uh, minus your sodium level, and it gives you how much you need to get where you want to go. Um, and generally, it's given over 6 to 12 hours. Um, if your patient is in a coma or having seizures, um, then you go ahead and you give them the 3% saline. Um, now, it depends on each patient. So I ran some numbers on a patient who's 70 kilograms. Um, we wanted to get back up to 125. So, um, and I'll talk about it in a second, um, how 125 is kind of the number you want to get up to quickly and then go slowly after. Um, anyway, so we want to go up to 125 and her sodium um, is 110. So her deficit here is 15 and 60% of 70 kilograms is 42. I didn't do it in my head. Um, and you multiply those together and you get um, 630. So, 
in a three percent, a, bag, a liter of three percent saline, you have 513 mil equivalents. Um, so if you do the math, you'll need a little bit more than one liter. So you need like 1.2 liters. So while you're calling everybody, you can have someone trying to figure that out and actually get all that ordered if you need to, um, and kind of help your patient out rather than just kind of sitting there, like I would have done normally without reading all this. Um, if there's no CNS symptoms or no seizure, no coma, anything like that, um, or you've replaced the initial sodium back up to 125 or so, uh, then you can infuse with normal saline at a slow rate um, and replete that way. Um, and then, so with hypernatremia, you have too much sodium. Usually it's a result of fluid contraction or um, uh, intravascular volume depletion. So the, the only thing to do is you replete what you do with a hypotonic solution. Um, you usually do it with half normal saline uh, and you can get it, um, you kind of dilute it, get it back down. <coughs> Excuse me. With hypokalemia, so um, low potassium, you have either um, mild or asymptomatic, and then you have severe um, symptomatic. If they're mild, asymptomatic, it's routine labs. Um, usually the, the number is less than three and a half or four. Um, you can give them PO, KCL. Uh, you can't really give them anything, any other type of uh, salt or rely on dietary potassium because it doesn't effectively bring up their values in time. Um, when you have severe or symptomatic infusion, um, sorry, when you have severe or symptomatic loquet, um, sometimes they'll manifest with weakness, fatigue, numbness, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, constipation, um, some kind of general symptoms, but they also may have heart palpitations. Um, usually whenever they're like this, you want to get an EKG, um, make sure that the heart rate's fine. Um, and then you want to give them some IV KCL. Um, usually you want to give them about um, no more than 40 milliequivalents at a time and no faster than a rate of 10 milliequivalents every hour. Um, and you can cause hyperkalemia and you can cause um, changes in the EKG. Um, if you're having to replete these patients pretty aggressively, they really shouldn't have over 120 to 160 mil equivalents an entire day. Um, so that's three or four rounds of what you're going to give them, of the 40 mil equivalents. <clears throat> okay, so you get with, um, with low potassium, you can have moderate or mild, moderate, and severe. With hyperkalemia, you can have the same thing. So. When you have a patient who is in severe hyperkalemia, you want to get an EKG. Um, usually when they're having symptoms, they have similar symptoms actually. Weakness, fatigue, numbness, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramping, constipation, heart palpitation. It's the same symptoms. Um, you'll get an EKG. If they're like that, usually their, their level will be over 7 mil equivalents. Um, and these are the steps you want to perform. Again, if they're this high, you get an EKG, call somebody. Call your staff. Um, call medicine, call MI, get someone who's, or, uh, someone who's used to doing things like this. We don't routinely do this. Um, but if you know about it, you may be able to do the first few things while you're waiting on someone to come help you. Um, so you can infuse, um, especially if the EKG changes, you can infuse 10, 10 milliliters of calcium gluconate um, while they're on, uh, hopefully, telemetry. Um, if you don't have them on telemetry, I wouldn't do this. Um, but you can do that twice, um, right, one right after the other if you need to. You can also give them uh, 10 units of insulin. You want to give them some glucose to offset the insulin so you don't make them hypoglycemic, um, as well as 50 mil equivalents of sodium bicarb. Um, so the, uh, the insulin will shift the potassium um, into the cells out of the bloodstream, okay, out of the um, serum by um, <clears throat> it pumps sodium um, into the cells that activates, activates sodium potassium ATPase, which then pumps uh, potassium into the cell. Um, and usually this onset, oops, this onset of action is 15 minutes or so. Um, so you want to watch for any hypoglycemia at that time, um, and you can pretty readily get some new labs to make sure that her... Um, Potassium's coming down. 
Now you can also give them KXLate, um, polystyrene uh, sulfonate. You can give it PO if she's tolerating PO. NG2 if she has one in or she's throwing up and you put one in or you can give them an enema and make sure it doesn't come out. Um, it will bind the extra potassium uh, and they'll, they'll pass it out as stool and diarrhea. The, the dose is here, 20 to 50 grams every two, uh, two to four hours. Um, and keep watching the EKG, watch her, her, um, her uh, clinical status. Uh, and if you need to, if it stays high or it's really high, you may need to get uh, nephrology on board and do some dialysis to get her potassium down. Um, with moderate or mild hyperkalemia, <clears throat> um, you really just you can restrict their their dietary potassium. Um, let the nutritionist know, the cafeteria know, and they cut 50 to 60 milliequivalents every day, and that should help bring it down some. You can also use KXLate um, if you need to. With um, calcium imbalance, so <clears throat> about. 99% of your calcium is contained um, in your bones, and then 40% of that, 1% that's extracellular is bound by um, uh, albumin. Um, so whenever you're trying to make sure that your level is really high or really low, uh, you need to use this formula for the corrected calcium. Uh, again, don't routinely use this. Um, I use it a few times on um, tumor, so it's, it's good to have on hand to know whenever you're really looking to see, to figure that out. Um, their calcium's low, you can um, do long-term supplementation through their diet. Um, usually these patients are asymptomatic. Um, the l low level is under eight or eight and a half. Um, and they can have numbness, muscle cramps, um, carpal tunnel spasm, or carpal spasms, uh, or uh, twitching of the facial muscles, even tetany and seizures, okay? Um, so you need to look out for all that. But typically these patients, are asymptomatic. Now, <clears throat> if they show any of these signs, um, you can give them calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate, or calcium chloride through the uh, through the IV. Um, and if their calcium is too high, um, really you just need to give them normal saline. Um, normal normal saline will decrease calcium reabsorption at the proximal tubule in the kidney. Um, and they'll pee it out and they'll, they'll have a lower, um, lower level. You can also give them bisphosphonates. Um, bisphosphonates inhibit osteoclast precursors, uh, which then decrease the number of osteoclasts, and then <clears throat> you don't get the breakdown of bones, you don't get the free calcium uh, in the serum. Um, and it's been shown that zoledronic um, acid is better than uh, pomidronate at doing this. <clears throat> okay, magnesium. Um, Kind of similar with um, calcium, you'll have a, uh, you can have a mild to moderate um, deficit. Typically, these patients are asymptomatic. You can just give them elemental um, magnesium um, daily, to four times daily, and they'll typically come up over time. Um, if they're if it's severely low, and we're really comfortable with it. We can give them IV mag. We know what to look out for whenever they have any kind of toxicity or anything like that. Um, because you have hypermagnesemia, so high magnesium, um, usually it's iatrogenic from either repleting it or with our, or with our OB patients. Um, the treatment is to stop it, and if they're symptomatic, um, then you can give calcium gluconate. Um, typically, these patients will have respiratory depression or fatigue, lethargy, things like that. And the last electrolyte that we're looking at. Um, is phosphorus, so usually levels below three to two and a half are uh, considered low. Again, with these patients are also asymptomatic most of the time, um, and usually they're low because they have malabsorption or um, they have a vitamin D deficiency, things like that, or they drink a lot of alcohol. Alcoholics have kind of low um, phosphorus. Um, so you need to treat the underlying cause. If they continue to have low phosphorus, then you can uh, replete it over time with PO, elemental phosphorus. Um, and high phosphorus, normally not seen in normal patient population, usually seen in renal failure. These patients are usually on binding agents, the sevolemur and things like that, um, and they're undergoing dialysis.
is it. Um, the, one of the um, points to not ordering preoperative labs and mm -hmm. not doing just a um, gunshot mm -hmm. to everybody. Uh, it mentioned um, nutritional status, and poor nutritional status being uh, something that you would order labs for. Mm -hmm. How do you assess someone's nutritional status? Well, hopefully in your history, then you, I mean, I guess if you've seen them before and you know they're losing weight or it's the first time you've seen them and their BMI is 17. I mean, really you need to be screaming for it if you can't see it over time. Um, I guess ask them about GI habits, whether they have diarrhea, uh, constipation, things like that. I mean, you just have to really delve into it and ask them. I mean, it's not something that you've gotten out of the school or certainly we don't train about it in residency. Um, but you can be in normal weight and still have poor nutritional True. status. And I mean, that's kind of the caveat to all of those. Well, I can justify my gunshotting in these labs because uh, I don't routinely ask about nutritional status, nor do I probably know how to ask about right. nutritional status. Sometimes it's fairly obvious, like you said, um, obesity and things like that, or even um, underweight, BMI is less than 17. but. When you're of a normal weight, are you even asking the questions? I mean, probably not. Yeah. Well, that's the thing, though. I mean, this has been heavily researched and debated for 50 plus years, and you would see, you would think it would be kind of intuitive, but it's not. Um, especially when you bring cost into it, I think is the other big part of it. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have any questions or comments? Uh, talking about your pre-renal azotemia and looking at fractional excretion of sodium, mm -hmm. um, does that apply for patients on a diuretic? I don't know. I think I read it. Yeah, you, I'm not sure. You were told it on the rotation. <laughs> Dr. Morgan? Is that eight years in here with oncology? So we look at fractional excretions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Okay. So fractional excretion is something else, but now I can't remember what that is. <laughs> urea? Urea, very good. Yes, yeah, so you look at fractional excretion of urea to look for pre renal. Why do you routinely, or what do you do? As far as routinely screening magnum post op, because on benign GYN, you don't. Yeah, they're, they are. The, probably the two most involved in um, wound healing in these people with cancers who are immune compromised and they're at risk for wound healing. Um, also, they can have perineoplastic syndromes where they have magnum phosphorus wasting with these cancers. Um, and besides, they're also cardiac electrolytes, potassium, magnum phosphorus, calcium. That's kind of what spurred on this. That's, that's routine two. trauma and ICU. We, we always keep those electrolytes elevated in normal ranges. Thank you.